Hello AV Physics 1 students, please make sure your notes are in front of you and we're ready to get started on our final topic before the AP exams, although we've actually already finished all the AP Physics 1 topics with our studies of circuits and this really is an AP Physics 2 topic, but it does complete uh, a good portion of the course and by the year is broken into three major parts and the third major part is electricity and magnetism and so we're finally getting into magnetism. Now I'm sure you already know a whole bunch about magnets and magnetism. You've studied them before, you've played with magnets before, so you know some things, and I, in class I would be doing some demonstrations and let you tell me you know, what you already know about it. But certainly one of the things you already know is that if you have magnets near each other, you can apply forces to each other without contact, and we've seen this idea before, and every time we've seen this sort of non-contact necessary force, we've always described it as having a field. And so yes, there is a magnetic field, and so we will define that. And we need a symbol for magnetic field. In class, I would ask you if you happen to know what the symbol is for magnetic field. It's not one of those obvious ones, considering lowercase m is already taken for mass, and capital M sometimes we use for mass as well, so it's not going to be that. And unless you've seen it before, you're not going to know. And so it is going to be capital B, because, you know, that makes sense. Nope. Uh, I feel like we just ran out of letters, so we had to use capital B for something or other. And just like all other fields, it is a vector quantity, so we'll put the vector arrow above it. The units for magnetic field are the capital T, which stands for Tesla. So it's capital T in honor of his name. If you get a unit named after you, of course, you'll be capitalized in your honor. A Tesla is defined as a Weber per meter squared. Capital W, lowercase b, stands for Weber, a unit that you probably aren't familiar with. We will get to it later on in the topic. We'll circle back on here, back around to this, and we'll see how it relates. But uh, one Tesla is one Weber per meter squared. Alternate units for magnetic field are the Gauss, capital G for Gauss. We've seen Gauss's law before, and he gets a unit named after him. And the relationship there is that one Tesla is equal to 10,000 Gauss. So you use Tesla for large fields, like uh, magnet, magnet you find in a laboratory, and use Gauss for smaller fields. A full Tesla of field is actually a very, very strong magnet. Or really magnetic field, I should say. Now, as it turns out, B doesn't actually stand for magnetic field, even though I just introduced the term to you. I'm actually going to backtrack just a second. When you go to higher levels of physics, you'll find that capital B actually stands for something different called magnetic flux density, which sounds infinitely cooler. Um, for all intents and purposes, what we're going to be doing here in AP Physics 1, magnetic field, magnetic flux density, mean the same thing, although when you go to higher levels of physics, you'll learn they do have some separate meanings. I just didn't want you to go off to college and come back and say, you know, you didn't tell us about this magnetic flux density stuff. I did. And so capital B really stands for magnetic flux density. The real symbol for magnetic field is capital H, which makes even less sense, or maybe just as much little sense as capital B. So it doesn't matter, though. We're going to use capital B for magnetic field. Just we know in our heart of hearts it actually stands for magnetic flux density, but don't worry about the difference. Okay, so I want you to have the notes page in front of you with the fundamentals of magnetism, just like we've done the fundamentals of charge. We started electricity. We'll now be doing the fundamentals of magnetism, a lot of stuff you already know, and we'll be filling in some other things. And so, of course, you should know there's only two types of poles. You know they are north and south. Great. All magnets are usually labeled north and south or by different colors. You indicate the north and south poles. Number two, opposite poles attract, like poles repel. Good. You all know that stuff. Okay, and so, so far, is starting to sound an awful lot like electric effects, right? We have the positive charge and the negative charge, and opposite charges attract, and like charges repel. But I want to make sure we're very, very clear that electricity and magnetism are completely separate ideas. That while there certainly are similarities, and certain types of objects interact in similar ways, they're just not the same thing. So magnets have a north end and a south end. There's no positive end, there's no negative end. In fact, unless they're told other information, a magnet is not an electrically charged object at all. It's a neutral object. And we're just using similar words to describe the fact there's two different types of something or other in electrostatic effects, and two different types of something or other in magnetic effects, and they interact in similar ways. But I want to make sure we're very, very clear. Electricity is on one side, and magnetism is on the other side. That They're just not the same thing at all. OK, number three. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But if you break a magnet into pieces, you may know that each piece gets its own north and south poles. That's right. And in class, it turns out I have some broken magnets, uh, broken by some former students, strangely enough. And I would be doing a really great demonstration where I have the, the magnet. I'll show you the north pole and the south pole. And I open it up to show the broken end. And the other end gets the exact opposite pole, either attracting or repelling another magnet nearby. It's a very effective demonstration, which unfortunately we're not going to be able to do right here. And I wasn't able to find anything on YouTube. And so hopefully when we come back, I can show you these demonstrations. But anyway, so over here is a picture of a bar magnet. We're going to go ahead and label the north and south poles, just north on the left, south on the right. This is right here on your notes page. And then right below it, we're going to draw it broken 
broken. Here are the original north and south poles, and so each of these pieces gets its own north and south. So here's the original north, it gets a new south. Here's the original south, it gets a new north. You can see they actually would attract each other back to form the original. And right below we're going to draw broken into even more pieces and draw the original poles and their new poles. So every single piece of this gets a north and a south pole. And you can see they sort of would attract each other back to form the original. It turns out you can just keep doing this, keep bringing it smaller and smaller and smaller. We're not going to draw more pictures, but just imagine bringing it smaller and smaller. Every little bit that comes off has its own north and south pole all the way down to the atoms inside. In fact, the atoms inside, something that's magnetic, have a north and south pole. And it seems like we can't isolate just one or the other. And so to complete this statement here, we say there are no magnetic monopoles, where, of course, mono means one. It seems like in nature we just cannot isolate the single north or the single south. It seems like it just doesn't exist, and we've been trying for many, many years to locate it. In fact, a lot of things would be cleared up if we could, because there are a lot of similarities between electricity and magnetism, even though they're not the same thing. We have the single positive in the form of a proton, the single negative in the form of an electron, and we have all sorts of rules and equations that are based on these single point charges. It would be really great if we could have a single point pole, a north or a south. We could get some equations that would look an awful lot like electrostatics, but it just doesn't seem to exist. There's been some research done, and they've actually, uh, in lab, formed an artificial monopole, an individual north or a south. But in nature, it just seems like it doesn't exist. The universe won't seem to allow it. But of course, you know what? Research is being done. So maybe one of you will go on, and you'll find the naturally occurring magnetic monopole. And of course, you'll get a Nobel Prize for doing so. And don't forget, speech, thanks, you know the rest. OK, let's continue on here. Let's go back uh, into our notes. And in class, I would be doing a demonstration using a device called an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope is a very old device. I mean, there are, there's some more modern ones that are digital, but the one I have in class is a very old one. It's a very large object. And inside is a what's called a cathode ray tube. Uh, if you don't know what a cathode ray tube or something that's called a CRT, maybe you have one in your house, in your basement, your attic, or something like that. Old school televisions or old school computer monitors that were much larger than our flat screens, they had CRTs in them. And basically a CRT or a cathode ray tube is just um, basically an electron gun. It's a tube that's been evacuated from air, and you put a large potential difference across it, and you can cause electrons to zip across this potential difference. And then there's a screen in the way, and where the screen lights up, often a green color, that's where electrons are hitting. And so I'm going to have you watch a YouTube video where they're doing a demonstration using an oscilloscope and some magnets nearby it. And it's basically the same demonstration I would have done in class. And so you're going to learn something from that, and then we're going to come back to our notes to build from there.